just going to amplify an echo, I think, more than anything else. So I'm sorry that was up while you were there, Sarah. That's uh, past struggle, and I become the dinosaur again, against exploitation, domination, dispossession, and devaluation, and I'll say exactly why. I had to do a, a session recently uh, for Pitt and Purzel that's commenting on the Pride Fall, and writing the paper for it, I just cried my way through my whole desk. It was just extraordinary. And I was thinking, what's happened since 1979? And for me, that was when class struggle was lost if you were working class. And you can actually see this structurally very clearly. And I do want people, and the reason I put this on, you can go to the Margaret Thatcher Org site to get the Ridley Report, where the class war was actually developed and designed. That attack was purposefully when the state and capital came together to destroy the working class. Since then, we've had the longest depression of wages, the top rates of income tax have halved. It was 83% income tax in 1979. Most people can't believe that. And I think things like um, the super rich uh, increased their value by £69 billion pounds alone last year. <laughs> Real incomes for the poorest have fallen 40%, 33% of families lack basic resources, cost of living has written by 25%. So really, I'm just echoing what you were saying about zero hours and things like that. I think this is great. There are more servants now working in London than there were 200 years ago. Uh, most people, now this is what's really, really significant in connects to Sarah's point, most people have huge debts now. That's what's really, really significant in this pre present period. And I think we're in a period of what Laura Blanc calls slow death, where a lot of people are being allowed to die, or fat people were called the great social investment for the companies that exploit them. But I do believe against exploitation, pure exploitation, and interestingly, I'm not talking about the labour theory of value here, or I can, um, <laughs> but what I'm talking about, there is a constant struggle against this, and, the, and you know, it's a battle, it's a constant battle, anybody who's been a member of a union since the academics have just given themselves a 20% pay, pay cut, everybody knows this is a struggle. Right? I also think there's a big struggle against domination. I think that's what exactly what Imogen was describing in fantastic detail. Against the dominant symbolic. You know, who is able to access that dominant symbolic to legitimate their interests? And there were key moments in British history, the 1834 Reform Act, where the middle class legitimated their own power symbolically and used every form of aesthetic culture, art, cartoons even, to legitimate themselves. So I do think television, the media of whatever form it is, absolutely essential. And what Imogen is doing brilliantly is detail, that, through that really clear cultural analysis. And for me, we have to extend that out. We have to move from television and literally see it in those very old-fashioned ideological terms as ideological state apparatuses. The media works with the law and welfare. And it's those judgments when they come into effect and are institutionalised that are really, really powerful. When we were doing our reality TV research, um, we found Anita Veresi stuff and followed it through. And it was amazing that Ian Duncan Smith had employed Emily Harrison to be the head of A4E, who was advising the government on work programmes while her assistant was also doing um, oh, what's it called? The benefit one? I've forgotten the name of it. One that they did in Middlesbrough again and got huge resistance to. Um, super, super nanny. No, not super nanny. The job. The job on benefits. Do you know what What's it called? Um, job's mother. Very well, mother. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I don't get old. Um, anyway, in response to the, the way values institutionalised against domination, and I think what Imogen points out, and that's so important, the debates around losing the word class, I think, have been critical, absolutely critical. We haven't lost the word race, we haven't lost the word gender, we haven't lost the word queer. We've still got lots of politics around those. We have lost the word class. And it's not surprising, Tony Blair, Margaret, that you, the all guy who doesn't exist, with the great help of sociologists, you know, Hiddens, Beck, lots of them, I'm not going to name them, all going, no, class isn't important. And I personally was subject to that for about 30 years, uh, when they just said, yeah, don't talk about it, it's just modernism theory. Anyway, I think it's very important to keep fighting against it. It's about deauthorizing those who tell you what to think and what to speak and what to say, and it's about delegitimating delegitimating those who want to have legitimation. And so I think, and it's very interesting, I will come to this at the end, 
that I've just been recently putting together exactly the same time as reading your paper, because your paper's for the Sociological Review um, double issue on the Great British Class Survey, which I now call the Great British Stratification Survey. But at the same time, Roland and Joanna wrote a fantastic paper, Imogen wrote a fantastic paper, and they talk about culture as world-making, or Imogen is about a political economy. And I think it's very important to think about cultural struggles not culture as consumption. And that leads me to the struggle against dispossession. And absolutely, accumulation through dispossession, that's why we have the rich that we have. That's why we have the landed wealth. That's why we have the Duke of Westminster, still alone in most of London. Primitive accumulation, the original enclosures, were designed phenomenally. I mean, it's just such a beautiful, not beautiful, but just such an incredibly straightforward process. You throw people off with the land, you criminalise them. When you criminalise them, you ship them off to America in the interest of colonialism to build slave colonies to develop imperialism on a world scale. That is dispossession. At the moment, it's going on a much smaller scale, or you could argue it's going on in Greece, uh, in class cleansing. We've seen phenomenal... <coughs> moving out of young, poor women in London at the moment. But they're, they're fighting the struggle. They're actually winning, well, little bits against it. E, the E15 movement, the New Era movement, phenomenal gentrification, as Kirsty's documented. And in the UK at the moment, families made homeless every 15 minutes. But there's also, and I want to say, as Imogen did stress, this is global, and all her work points to the significance of global movements and migration. And so to, again, echo the state punishment of the unproductive. Uh, we've had £18 billion pounds in welfare cuts to date, but I think the most significant cuts are those that attack the disabled. They will have lost £28 billion pounds alone by 2017. For me, this is an attack on the unproductive. So it's not even those who can be exploited, it's those who have no value through exploitation. Now, I think there are many struggles against this, and there's something quite disgusting about attacking those who cannot defend themselves very well. So I think that there are struggles going on. And then my last, nearly last slide, struggles against devaluation. And exactly as you've pointed out, and the horror of having to do a research project on reality TV remains with me, but the fact that people are forced to perform their devaluation. They're forced to perform their need for humiliation. For me, reality TV, and I did spend three years studying it, is about humiliation and shaming. But also, interestingly, with our audience research, about resisting that, that humiliation and shaming. Our audiences did not accept and found humiliation absolutely horrific. So there was something really good in the response and the struggles through audiences to reality TV. Now, I want to kind of put that into your stuff because if you just read this stuff textually, you just want to shoot yourself. If you actually work with audiences, you see that they are actually resisting not just the techniques of humiliation, but the content as well. Um, so there's all sorts of ways of understanding that. And I think it's very interesting because... The subjects of value that I chart in, in the class self-culture book really are the middle class making themselves more open to exploitation. They enterprise themselves up in order to be more effectively exploited. So there's all sorts of things going on there. And then, of course, the object subjects of reality television. <coughs> Imogen's revolting subjects book, which you didn't talk about a lot, is really, really, really important on that. So I do think there's a lot of refusal. There's a huge amount of defence. And I think there's lots of alternative values established, and that's why I still do ethnography when I can. Because um, we see solidarity. We see people who hate instrumentalism. They do not want to, you know, stamp on their neighbours. And we, I take a lot of part from a lot of the anthropological work around just talk, very important stuff. Now, I think I've come to a slightly different conclusion to you in this, because I'm, I'm full classification in a strategically political way because I think if we lose the term class we cannot and I come to this through ethnographic work we cannot understand the effects of injustice that people feel we were working with some very young women and they didn't know what class was and they didn't understand why everybody hated them and they didn't understand why they were looked down on all the time they didn't understand that humiliation and injustice but their parents did. Their parents could talk about class and they were trying to explain it to them, but it was quite hard. 
So I think it's very important that we keep this term. Um, and, and talking about declassification can be slightly worrying because I do know what you're saying, but I do think we have to kind of fight hard where we, you know, I don't think anybody would want to get rid of the idea of fighting against racism. We've got to keep fighting against this and we need that word that keeps the affects connected to the ideas. And I think, you know, class is performative. As you say exactly, it's a struggle against visualisation. It brings things into view. So I just want to end by saying, I think, to kind of even add more almost, to echo and amplify power, domination, dispossession and devaluation. Class is not stratification, as I know John and Ron agree, but it really, really isn't stratification. Stratification is a study of status, hierarchy and differentiation. And I mean, there is that great article that you sent to me where somebody says there is no um, class hostility in Britain because when people talk about consumption, they don't dislike other people's tastes. That's not what I call class struggle. <laughs> that is not how I would define class struggle. There's no exploitation in that. So it is very, very important that we focus on class struggle, not stratification. And I think it's very important that we think about how these connect right through. Class constitutes, it disrupts, it's messy. We need to understand how it works through other classifications. And I think we have to keep fighting to keep it on a sociological agenda, because of course lots of people don't want it there, and it is a struggle. So that's why I am so pleased that not just Imogen's here, I mean, there's, there's lots of quite wonderful people in this audience who've written incredibly important things about class. So it's amazing a moment. It really is an amazing moment that this is happening now. So thank you very much. <laughs>